You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. And to Treasures in Heaven. From all of us at WCAT Radio, we're glad you're with us. I am your host, Dr. William Ailes. In this show, The Hope of Glory, Part 2. Paul gave us revelation regarding the mystery of God. The mystery of God includes this hope of glory. We're going to begin with what Paul gave us in Colossians. I became a minister according to the divine office, which was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now made manifest to his saints. For them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man mature in Christ. For this I toil, striving with all the energy which he mightily inspires within me. That's from Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 through 29. So what we're looking at is the riches of the glory of the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Of course, Christ in you is being baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is being born of God, which is directly connected to our hope of glory, our hope of future glorification with Christ. There is a time coming, and it's only a matter of time, that our king will return. He will descend from the right hand of God to gather us, his kingdom, unto himself to forever be with our king. This hope of glory is a living hope that we have. This is designed to live in our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strengths, knowing that what we have in this life is only a shadow of what's to come in the next life. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. Brethren, join in imitating me, and mark those who so live as you have an example in us, For many of whom I have told you and now tell you, even with tears, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But, in contrast, our commonwealth or our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. It's Philippians three seventeen through 21. Paul is drawing a contrast between those who reject Christ, the enemies of the cross of Christ, and us who embrace the cross of Christ. Those who live as enemies of the cross of Christ mind earthly things. Their God is in their belly. In other words, their selfish, fleshly desires is all they can think about. And their end is destruction, because the wages of sin is death. We have this hope of glory, a living hope, Verse 20, but in contrast to those enemies of the cross of Christ, there's us. And Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. You know, I am a citizen of the United States, but I'm also a citizen of heaven. If you embrace Christ, you have dual citizenship. Whatever your native country is, and in addition, you are a citizen of heaven. And we'll get to that soon, how we are seated in the heavenlies by Christ. 
We are citizens of heaven, and from it, from heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in this life, in this world, we are in the kingdom of Christ. He's reigning from the right hand of God. There's going to come a time, a threshold in time, where Christ is going to descend from the right hand of God in all his splendor and in all his glory. And when he does, he will change our lowly or earthly body to be like his glorious body by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. So, by the power of God, our bodies will be transformed from earthly, from flesh and blood, to like his glorious body, eternal, spiritual, glorious body. This is part of our hope of glory, the glorious body that we shall receive and live forever with Christ. We have been giving a glimpse into what this glorious body looks like because the glorified Christ appeared to the Apostle John. Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe, with a golden girdle around his breast. His head and hair were white as wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth issued a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. There it is. There's the glorified Christ. Eyes like a flame of fire. His hair was white as white wool, white as snow. Feet like burnished bronze. The voice like the sound of many waters. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. That's Christ glorified body. Verse 17, when I, John, saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I die, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. That's our Lord and Savior. This is what is to come, coming attractions. And the plan of God made known to us by revelation in the first century. And this is how John introduced his letter. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come. From the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. That will be the descent of our Lord from the right hand of God. Every eye will see him. Every eye on planet Earth will see the glory of Christ in the sky. Everyone who pierced him and all the tribes of the Earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. We will be very blessed, pleased, excited, overjoyed. No motions can describe what it will be like to see our Lord and our Savior and all his glory in the sky. But not everyone will look forward to that day. Those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, they're going to wail on account of him. In any event, this is a prophecy. This is all wrapped up 
into the hope of glory that we are born into. And so we'll read about from the Apostle Peter. First, back to the Gospels. Recall when Jesus was with his disciples. He knew his time was up and soon would be led away in chains to be crucified. But this is what he said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. You know where I am going, and you know the way. Well, he was going to be with his Father in heaven, and the way to the Father in heaven is through Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. This is Jesus Christ issuing a prophecy to his followers, which is just as valid today as it was when he first spoke it. Let not your heart be troubled. Look at this time we're living in, this unprecedented, uncharted waters blown about with the winds of turmoil. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's paramount. Number one, believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he is the living word of the living God in the flesh, that he is the anointed one. He is the one prophesied from Moses to Malachi that he is our Lord and our Savior. We make him our Lord in our lives. We confess him as Lord. We confess him as Savior. That's what it means to believe in him. That what Jesus said of himself, everything he said of himself, is true. When he said he's the way, the truth, and the life, that's it. He's the way, the truth, and the life. When you come right down to it, either he told the truth or he lied. I'll go with him telling the truth. I've seen the results in my life, and I trust you have too. Having a moral and spiritual compass based upon the standard of the Word of God. And, of course, our church leadership having guides in the Bible and present tense guides. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. There he is. I'm telling you the truth is what he's saying. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm leaving. I will ascend to my Father, but... While I'm there, I'm preparing for you. I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. That is our destiny. What are we currently? Citizens of heaven. As far as Jesus Christ is concerned, we're already citizens of heaven. So where else would our ultimate destiny be other than being with him in heaven with the Father. Let not your heart be troubled. This is our hope of glory. Now, the Apostle Peter spoke of this in his first letter. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Peter's first letter, grace to you and peace be multiplied. First Peter chapter 1 Now, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The new birth is 
Christ in you. That Holy Spirit within us is the Spirit of God. It's also an eternal, incorruptible seed, which Peter wrote about, which we'll read about in a moment. That's Christ in you. You, Christ is seated at the right hand of God, but spiritually speaking, he is within us. Like even the term Christian, the term Christian basically means Christ in. In the book of Acts, uh, it records when they first started calling the followers of the way, which they first were, followers of the way, Christians. Just Christ in you, Christian. That's the new birth into a living hope. The living hope is the hope of glory Paul spoke, spoke about. It is this expectation that this flesh and blood body, which is finite, will be transformed into what is infinite, immortal. That's the prophecy. That's our living hope. To the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an incorruptible and undefiled inheritance that does not fade away, kept in heaven for you. This hope of glory is the glorified body. But being in Christ's kingdom, we have an inheritance. Being in the family of God, we have an inheritance. And where is it kept? In heaven for you. Where did Christ say that he will bring us to be with him? In heaven with the Father. That's where our inheritance lies. In Christ's revelation to Peter goes on to say how we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here we are in this life. We have a new birth into a living hope. And we are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That coming salvation, that's what will bring forth the brand new eternal spiritual bodies. That's what we're looking to. And later in this letter, Peter writes this. You have been born again. It's also translated born anew. Not from perishable seed, but imperishable. Through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Now we stop and pause a moment. This Holy Spirit within us, is Christ in us. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But Peter is giving us another perspective on what is within us. Imperishable seed. It's a seed, a spiritual seed, how God is our Father. God is Spirit. His seed is Spirit. And you think about this, the seed that he put in Mary came from the Holy Spirit. The seed that he puts in us comes from the Holy Spirit within us. This seed within us is imperishable, meaning it can never perish. It can never decay. Why? Because it's an eternal spirit. We're born of God. As John says, born of God by way of an imperishable spirit. And then Peter quotes the Old Testament. All flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Like Christ said, every jot, every tittle must be fulfilled as given. And if the Bible says we have this hope of glory, 
or born of an imperishable seed, or protected by God's power through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, then I believe it. We have an anticipation within us that builds. Every day we live, is one day closer to the descent of our king from the right hand of God. We look forward to time ticking on because we have a living hope. Now, back to... Peter, we're going to see what Peter had to say on the day of Pentecost. We're talking about this living hope that we have. You know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was upon the prophets of God, but nobody was born of God in the Old Testament. Nobody was born of God until, meaning, you know, of course, Jesus Christ was born of God, but everybody else. Nobody was born of God until the day of Pentecost. Fifty days after the resurrection came the day of Pentecost. The disciples are assembled together. Out of heaven comes the rush of a mighty wind. Tongues of fire rest on the disciples. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is the first time in the history of man that the Holy Spirit filled man born of God, baptized in the Holy Spirit, the first time anybody could have Christ in them. Until that time, Christ, of course, was in his flesh and blood, earthly body, crucified, resurrected, walked the earth for 40 days after his resurrection. The 40th day, he he ascended to the right hand of God in his glorified body, And there he remains with his glorified body. When he sat down on the right hand of God after his ascension, ten days later came the day of Pentecost. That's when our great high priest baptized his disciples with the Holy Spirit for the first time. Remember the prophet John, John the Baptist? I baptize you with water, but there is one who is mightier than I that comes, and he shall baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. That prophecy was fulfilled not during Jesus' earthly ministry, but after he ascended to the right hand of God. Pentecost is marked as the birthday of the church, of course. That's when it all began. So for the first time in the history of man, We can be filled with the Holy Spirit, born of God, have Christ within us. Yes, he's seated at the right hand, but now he's in us. A first. And here it is 20 centuries later. It's just mind-boggling to think we're reading of this record that's from the first century. And here we are in the 21st century, and it means or carries as much significance as much power now as it did then. So Peter then quotes the prophet Joel. When the crowd hears them speaking in tongues, speaking in their languages, the mighty works of God, they're like, what does this mean? Peter quotes the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That prophecy was issued by Joel long before the time of Christ. Hundreds of years 
when would the prophecy be fulfilled? Joel didn't know, no one knew exactly when it would be fulfilled. It wasn't until the day of Pentecost Christ gave revelation to Peter to quote the prophet Joel. Because this prophecy that Joel had issued had now come to pass. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The last days began in the first century when God first poured out his spirit. 20 centuries later, he continues to pour out his spirit. Peter then ends the prophecy from Joel. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. And it shall be that whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the first time anyone understood what that prophecy would mean and how it would be fulfilled. It was a mystery, hidden in plain sight in the Old Testament, but neither Joel nor any other prophet knew how and when this prophecy would really be fulfilled. It's part of the mystery of God. Like Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Spirit being poured out is Christ in you. When the day of the Lord comes, we shall be saved. That's the hope of glory. Peter is revealing the mystery once hidden by God, fully made known on the day of Pentecost. And then the prophecies from Peter, from Paul, from John, all build off of this one prophecy from Joel. So when we read Christ in you, the hope of glory, the very first day on planet Earth that was made known was Pentecost, God pouring out his spirit. And that spirit, Peter says, is an imperishable seed. We are born into a living hope. That living hope is the hope of glory. It's when our bodies, our lowly bodies, are transformed from flesh and blood to spiritual, to be like his glorious body. All of this comes forth Because of what occurred on Pentecost, the Spirit being poured out, filling mankind, born of God, entering an eternal spiritual kingdom on this planet, directly connected to the hope of glory. We have an eternal king who reigns now and he will reign forever. In the Psalms, I'd like to read, you know, the Psalms have Psalms of hope. In the Old Testament, as we were talking, nobody was born of God. They had to live by the Old Testament law. They had to earn their righteousness by adhering to the law, the Torah that God gave to Moses. But the prophets prophesied of a coming Messiah. David looked forward to the coming Messiah, King David. They all knew that what the Old Testament represented was a template. It was a shadow of things to come, but no one really knew exactly how this would play out with the Messiah. We, in this day and time, look back on what occurred. You think about King David, he lived around 1000 BC. He's looking forward to the time 
that there would be a Messiah born of a virgin. Here we are looking back 2,000 years at what has already been accomplished. Our role is to embrace it, to embrace the perfect sacrifice for sin and to live accordingly. You know, we've been given a vision of how we can walk in this world, as lights in this world, in a crooked and perverse world. It's a way of being that has unmistakable joy, peace, hope, and love at the center of it. What other possible way of being would we want? And it's not just some empty philosophical man-made position, some personal take on the matter. This is direct divine revelation from Christ to us through his apostles. But think about in the Old Testament. They didn't have any of this. They didn't have the Savior to embrace looking back at what he already accomplished. They knew looking forward something was coming. They trusted in God. David trusted in God. That part of the Old Testament, in this implicit trust of God, is something we can still look to. We look back to the first century to what Christ accomplished. We look back to the first century to the revelation on who we are in Christ and what we shall be, of course. But we can also look back further in time to the Old Testament. They had a hope also. And contained in that hope, they had this implicit trust in waiting upon God. And I'd like to read Psalm 62. It's a psalm of King David. Verse 1. My soul waits in silence on God alone. Think about that. My soul waits in silence on God alone. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be greatly shaken. Those two verses, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 62, we can take unto ourselves. We have Christ in us. What do we do with it? What do we do with our mind and our heart? What's in our soul? What really inspires us and drives us throughout the day? My soul waits in silence on God alone. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be greatly shaken. This is spoken by a man who was not born of God. This is spoken by a man who had a heart like God's. A man after God's own heart. Look at the heart of King David. This, this is the life, the way of being within this life that we have, knowing we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. There's a way of being that we have within us and manifests. We implicitly trust God. We implicitly wait upon God. We, pl- we pray to God. Our allegiance is to God. Our, our moral compass, our ethical compass is based on God's word, our foundation. We have Christ in us now. We have this burning hope of glory in our hearts. We know what the finish line looks like. 
What do we do in the meantime? My soul waits in silence on God. From him comes my salvation. Verse 5. My soul waits silently for God, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be moved. What a, what a statement within the soul. Let that be our testimony. Speak to our soul. Speak to your soul. Soul, wait silently for God. Why? For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be moved. In the midst of this astonishing darkness that we live in, we have a testimony within our souls and our hearts and our minds. I will not be moved. Verse 7, in God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my shelter is in God. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a shelter for us. Selah. This testimony, let that be our testimony. This is our day and time. This is our generation. The torch has been passed to us. The apostolic doctrine passed all the way from the first century through all the church leadership. We now have the torch. Let our testimony be the same. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my shelter is in God. This is our testimony in this world, first to God, to ourselves, to our souls, and to those around us. So here we are. As Paul said, we are living epistles, meaning our lives are like letters. We are living letters of the Word of God. Paul said, you are living epistles known and read of all men. People read our lives. Nobody's fooled, especially God and Christ. So we have been handed this amazing truth of who we are in Christ. What they longed for in the Old Testament, we have it. It's ours to keep. It's ours to love. It's ours to enjoy. Peter is the one I'm going to finish with. Think about the first leader of the church. He wrote two letters to us. Of course, he gave us that astounding prophecy on Pentecost. Tremendous examples in the book of Acts of Peter healing, standing up to the temple authorities, witnessing to the Gentiles, seeing the Holy Spirit descend upon the Romans. Peter blazed new trails for us to follow. In Peter's second letter, I want to come back to where we were last week.
Peter said this, Beloved, do not be ignorant of this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Think about that. God, from his point of view, two days have elapsed between the first coming of Christ in our time in the 21st century. Two days. Imagine what that will be like in eternity. God's perspective on our lives is the perspective we need to keep in this world. We can think what we want of ourselves based upon decisions we've made, mistakes we've made, you know, the education we did get or didn't get, you know, no one gets through this life without trials. We have the ability to overcome our own minds by allowing God's perspective to take preeminence. And at times where things get dark, we have a living hope. We have something very tangible, the Word of God, to hold on to. If one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, that's the perspective that we have. The eternal spiritual bodies will go on and on and on. In this life, it's like we're in a live play. And the script is scripture. We have the ability to embrace the script. We have the ability to embrace a way of being between where we are now and where we shall be. And Peter writes about this. He speaks of how we should be in this world. When he writes about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's unmistakable intervention into human affairs, it's only a matter of time before it happens. Peter speaks of how this world order will ultimately pass away. Verse 10, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth also and the works that are in it will be burned up. Seeing then that all these things are to be destroyed, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness while you are waiting for and desiring the coming of the day of God? That's a real reality check. Peter's asking us to consider where we are now, what shall be, keep what shall be in your mind, in your heart, in your soul. Why? What sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? Peter says, lift our eyes off of the present moment. Look to what God is going to do in the future. He will bring this world order to an end. He's going to bring in a brand new world order. According to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's like being in a boat and seeing your ultimate destiny by way of the lighthouse. You can see where you're going. Yes, you're on the water. Yes, the winds are blowing this way and that way. Yes, the water is deep. You're in the boat. You can see the lighthouse. You have, we have this hope, and we do what we know to do to navigate our boat, our ship, paying attention 
to what shall be. There's a very good reason why this New Testament is full of prophecy of what shall be. Because it gives us a whole new dimension within our being. It purifies us, even as we are pure. In fact, I'm going to just take a look at this beautiful section in, in the first letter of John, in chapter 3. It says, verse 1, Consider how much love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. How are we called children of God? By flesh and blood? No. Spirit, born of God, that's how we are children of God, by spirit. Therefore, the world doesn't know us because it doesn't know him. Verse 2, beloved, now are we children of God. Right now in this world, we are children of God, born of God, not some pie in the sky, not in the sweet by and by, not when we die, Right now, we are born of God, children of God in the kingdom of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, we don't have the whole picture of everything God has in store for us. But, it states, we know that when he, Christ, appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. There's the coming hope of glory, the glorified body that Paul spoke of, changing our lowly body to a body like his, glorified body like his. When he appears, this is the appearance in the clouds, in the sky, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What a day. What a hope we have. This is our reality. This is not just empty words. This is who we are in Christ. Verse 3. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Look at that verse. The hope of the return of Christ purifies us just as we are pure. How is that possible? We are pure because we have a pure, holy spirit within us. We are pure, meaning no stain, because we have Christ within us. That's what's pure. That's what's holy. That's what's eternal. That's Christ in you. And everyone who has this hope, which is, the living hope we're born into, this hope of glory Paul spoke of, purifies himself. That's why it's so important to really lock into and understand what we have coming in the future. This word of God is living energy, as Hebrews says, sharper than any two-edged sword. This living energy that we put in our minds and hearts about what shall be, God says, purifies us. If that's what God says it does, it does. It purifies our hearts, our minds, to be ever closer to God, without question. There's the answer that we can give any man, any woman in the church. Why do I need to know what's coming? I got bills to pay right now. We all have bills to pay right now. But we all can enjoy being purified by the Word of God. That's, that's who we are in Christ. It's, it's incredible when you think about it. We can never take this for granted. All right, we'll go back to Second Peter. We're going to close out here. So 
Peter says we're waiting for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 14, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent that you may be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Spotless and blameless means we are above moral decay. You know, we're above what the flesh and blood would demand, the selfish flesh and blood. We're on a different plane, thinking spiritually. Nothing to accuse us of, blameless. Keep in mind that the patience of our Lord means salvation. Right now, the Lord is patient. Twenty centuries have elapsed since the first coming of Christ. That's a lot of patience from our point of view, but from his point of view, it's just a couple of days. But over the course of 20 centuries, God has been building his kingdom. Every century, every generation, building his kingdom. In fact, building an army which one day will be used against the Antichrist. Building a kingdom. Christ's kingdom has been growing since the first century. And here we are in the 21st century. His patience just continues, but there's going to be a threshold where it's going to come to an end, and then the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Out of nowhere will come the appearance of Christ in the sky, and as John said, Every eye shall see him. Keep in mind, the patience of our Lord means salvation. That's our salvation. It's the same salvation Peter prophesied of on Pentecost. The sun turns black and the moon turns blood red, marking the coming of the day of the Lord, and all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's the same salvation the coming salvation. Who are those that call upon the name of the Lord? It's defined right in the prophecy. Those upon whom the Spirit of the Lord is poured out. Those who have Christ in them have this living hope, this coming salvation. And as Peter wrote, even as our beloved brother Paul has also written to you according to the wisdom given to him. Paul prophesied of the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. Likewise did Peter. Paul prophesied of the coming salvation. Likewise did Peter. Peter prophesied of our living hope. Likewise did Paul. They're giving us different pieces of the puzzle, painting this glorious, beautiful picture of the finish line of what shall be when our Lord descends out of heaven. So with that, I'll just, well, I sit in awe over what we have and what shall be. This is our creator. He's going to recreate again a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And we're going to dwell with our Lord and Savior in spiritual bodies for eternity. And here's how Peter ends his letters, or ends his second letter, I should say. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listening to this radio show, the word of God that we heard is growing in knowledge. And how is it growing in grace? Growing in grace, we have a greater understanding of the grace bestowed upon us. In addition, grace can be bestowed upon us from God anywhere along our walk with him. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, from all of us at WCAT Radio, God bless you. 
and good night. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.